All right, well, good morning, everyone. Glad to see you here. Summertime has officially hit, and it is hot outside. Praise God for air conditioning in here today. Uh, if you uh, don't have a Bible and need one, just raise your hand and we'll get you a Bible. We have plenty in the back. Of course, we are going to be uh, in Scripture today and turning and flipping quite a bit is our, our norm here. So if you would, go ahead and start in the book of Hebrews. And uh, last week we're in chapter 10, and this week we're moving to chapter 11. And just to catch us up, last week we did cover Hebrews chapter 10, verse 32 through 39. And a lot of that had to do uh, with the fact that the Hebrews, as, as we've gone through, the author of Hebrews has really established the person and the work of Jesus Christ, especially that chapter 4 through chapter 10, just really focusing on the priesthood and the sacrifice, and now that we are at peace with God and the assurance that we have in Him. And then you apply that now, that we should have confidence in where we are going, and also it should be loving God and loving each other and stirring one another up, right, towards love and good deeds. And then we moved forward there to cover last week. Uh, the author encouraged them to keep going, keep persevering. They were in a time of persecution. They're in a time of suffering. The author of Hebrews is writing a people who are undergoing great difficulties. So what does he remind them of? We recall that he reminds them, recall, okay, remember the former days when you went through all these horrible things soon after their salvation. So again, this is a real people he is writing to, people who have been persecuted before. There was a time of peace, as sometimes is, whether this is internationally or, or here in the U.S. or wherever, but now there is a time of hatred again towards the Christians. What are they to do? They are to recall the difficult times but yet the fact that they persevered. And he listed out many of those uh, difficult times where they were publicly shamed. That is, the general population was anti-Christ, anti those who represented Christ. They were publicly shamed. Many were beaten, as we even recall. Many were stoned. Even Stephen was stoned to death. Uh, the Christians had their property plundered, taken away from them. Yet we also recalled last week that they responded in joy. And we even looked back at the book of Acts when Paul's persecution originally happened and believers had to run for their lives, flee, run, leave everything behind, but they did so with great joy. They continued to love God, they continued to love one another, and they continued to evangelize even when it would put them on the radar to be next persecuted. So from that, uh, we learned that when facing difficulties, a Christian should look to past successes and forward to the sure promises of God to find the strength to persevere in the present. And this is something that valuable that we need to apply and be ready for because persecutions, tribulations, trials, difficulties come in life. Just because you are a Christian does not mean that you have an easy life. You have an easy eternity, but your life can be very difficult. It can be very hard, as is the people that he's writing to here, right? So we should not expect everything just to be rosy and perfect now that we are a Christian. You don't see him telling the people that. He doesn't say, hey, I know you've gone through persecution, and that's gone. It'll never come again. No, he says, hey, you've gone through it. You persevered because you're a true believer. You're going through it again. What should you do? Recall your past successes, how God brought you through. Rely on him again. Keep persevering and keep your eyes on the prize. Your prize is not just to get through the earthly difficulty, and then you're a winner. Your eyes are to get all the way through this life and focus on the eternity that is to come, the city that God has prepared for them. So we also looked at some of these things as far as what would our response be if uh, such a persecution arose here. And a lot of times we think, oh, that could never, ever happen here. But uh, as of late, we kind of see the tide turning to where, where public shaming of Christians has become very popular. And that, that we're seeing that we're becoming more the minority where the public shaming and some of these other things could be on the rise. We don't know exactly what God has in plan for us, but we do need to be ready for whatever that is. If we look at the pastors in Canada that are being arrested, so the country to our north, we look at the country to our west, California, you know, it's got its own thing going over there. And they're arrest I mean, John MacArthur is fighting with, with the governors and mayors and everyone there just to have a 
place to preach the word. They were trying to shut his air conditioning off, shut the utilities off, shut the water off, take their parking, doing everything that they could possibly do, right? I mean, this is, so, so when we're reading this, it's not like we're saying, oh, wow, that's bad. I'm glad that can never happen here. The thing is, we need to be prepared for whatever is in store. If God ordains in his sovereignty that persecution, trials, tribulations come, or difficulties in general come to your life, what is your response? Persevere. Don't give up. You keep persevering, all right? And you look back and you look forward to find strength in this perseverance. Uh, let's move on today then to uh, ch uh, chapter 11, uh, verse 1 through 3. The author says, Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. For by it the people of old received their commendation. By faith we understand that the universe was created by the word of God, so that what is seen was not made out of things that are visible. Let's pray. Dearly Father, we thank you, we worship you. And we thank you, God, for the great examples that we have, even as we study the book of Hebrews, of, of people, real people like us, who were undergoing extreme persecution. They had done it before and gone through it and persevered. And we look to them and, and the others that the author of Hebrews is going to bring forward in chapter 11 as great reminders that people have gone through this life with great difficulty, but yet they persevered. God, I pray that we in our lives and our Christian walk would have such perseverance. May we never shrink back, but may we be proud of who Jesus is and what he has accomplished for our salvation. And even in a society that may be ever increasing uh, with, with hatred and disdain towards Christians, may we continue to speak the gospel. May we continue not to shrink back from representing Jesus Christ, but may we continue to shine even brighter in this dark world. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, as we look at uh, verse 1 there, as we continue on from chapter 10 to chapter 11, just a side note, and I've done this multiple times as going through the book of Hebrews, but uh, we, we always, I like to mention that the chapter division is not there as far as inspired by God, right? We acknowledge that. A, a monk put that into place, I believe. My memory serves me right. Late 1500s, the chapter divisions. But if you look there, there's really no need for a separate number or sep separate chapter number there to cause this divide. So we want to kind of smash those together and avoid the number 11 in your Bible. So look back at verse 39. I'll, you'll be able to see what I mean. How, how these flow just so easily together from right where we were last week right into the opening sentence of chapter 11. So if you read just those two sentences together as far as taking this in context before we go forward today, he says in verse 39, But we are not of those who shrink back and are destroyed, but of those who have faith and preserve their souls. Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. So you see what I mean, right? Your, your verse 1 is directly playing off the very last sentence even there where he is talking about we are, he is, he is talking to the, all, the Hebrews there that are persevering, they are preserving, they are going forward, they're not shrinking back, they're not, as he had said earlier, uh, trampling under feet the Son of God, they're not treating his sacrifice as nothing, that would be shrinking back, no, they're going forward, they're persevering, I am with Christ, I am on my way to heaven, I'm pressing forward, and now he goes on to verse 1, now faith is... And he defines this activity of faith. It's the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. So we see this is not wishful thinking. And this comes up a lot as we go through the book of Hebrews because in verse 1, we see things like this. Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for. But, but we, we have to remove kind of the modern definition of that. Last week I used that analogy of, you know, some people hope the Dallas Cowboys have a winning season. That is hopeless, okay? But, but, but that it could possibly, you know, everything, every, when everything looks like it could happen, it still doesn't happen. So, so a lot of times that's false hope, right? Even though that, but that's kind of that wishful thinking, fantasy thinking, you know? Uh, they call it fantasy football for a reason, okay? It's just like, you know, you're kind of hoping these things, but, but that's not what he's meaning here. 
When the Bible, and especially the author of Hebrews, uses the word hope, it is absolutely sure. And that's what you can see in the context. Context, context, context is how you best define the words in the Bible. So if you look at verse 1, now faith is the assurance. Assurance is surety. This is actually the, the language brought forth here has to do with a legal documentation. It's assurance as if God himself has signed this. It is in his blood, which is the case. This is the son of God. It's his blood that your salvation is signed in. And now we have the assurance of the things hoped for. So what we hope for is going to come because it's based on the legal binding contract of the new covenant that the whole book of Hebrews has, has kind of been about, right? So this is not wishful thinking. This is the surety. People are under persecution. What should they do? They should be resting in. Even though the world is crazy that they're in, circumstances are crazy, they're in the minority, they're being persecuted, uh, everything could be taken from them again, what are they to do? Rest in that assurity of what is to come. They have been made right with God, and they're going to be in eternity with him and all the blessings that accompany that. Now, what are the things hoped for? If you look back at verse 1, and if you continue there, the conviction of things not seen. So what are the things not seen? Uh, obviously, this is talking about that eternal destination, the things that we cannot see at this moment. So things that we see, you're obviously looking at me or looking at your Bible, people in front of you, your feet, the chair, whatever. You see this pulpit in front of me. We see these things with our eyes, and it takes no faith to know that these things are here. But yet, he's saying, faith is looking beyond what we can see, what we can touch, the things that are right here, to what is to come next. And that's, that's true faith. So Christianity is not just about right now, it's about what is to come also. And so he comforts these believers greatly in saying there is a whole eternity of things not seen, but that is absolutely certain. Remember, we, humanity cannot be in the presence of God because there is sin. Sin is a barrier between the blessed presence of God and humanity. We cannot fix that except Jesus Christ has, and that's what he has done. So the high priest has taken the perfect sacrifice of himself into the ultimate holy of holies, reuniting mankind, all who believe in the Christ, who have been, had their sins paid for by the Christ, to the dwelling place of God. And that's what we are looking forward to, and we have that hope. Again, not wishful thinking, but certainty. How do we know? Because Jesus lived, died, rose from the dead, ascended into heaven, and has gone there to prepare a place for us, and will come again and get us. And when we die, even as Paul said, he knew immediately he would be in the presence of Jesus Christ. So we have that assurance. We think of Stephen, who is proclaiming the gospel like a beast. I mean, he is just proclaiming it to the Sanhedrin, who had just put Jesus to death. And what do they, what do they want to do? They do stone him to death. But as they do, he sees Jesus standing, welcoming him into heaven. I mean, this is the surety that not only Stephen had, but that these believers should have, and we should have as well as we live this life. Now, this will be covered in a few weeks, but I want to go ahead and fast forward because I think we'll come back to this verse quite a bit. Hebrews chapter 11, look at verse 13 through 16, and we'll see more of what the author is speaking about here. Now he's speaking of the, the hope that we have, the assurance of that hope, uh, the, the conviction of things not seen. So he's making him think beyond this life. And it really comes to a head there in Hebrews 11, 13 through 16. We'll cover this more in depth as that passage gets here in a few weeks. But for right now, I just want you to take it in context from what we're looking at today. So he's going to list out a lot of, a lot of strong, faithful believers who persevered. And then in verse 13, he says, These all died in the faith, not having received the things promised, but having seen them and greeted them from afar, and having acknowledged that they were strangers and exiles on the earth. For people who speak thus make it clear that they are seeking a homeland. And if they had been thinking of that land from which they had gone out, they would have had 
opportunity to return. But as it is, they desire a better country that is a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared for them a city. Now, beautiful passage here that we're touching on kind of today, ahead of time, as far as the faith that perseveres is looking to where they are going. And it's very important because your eternal destination should definitely play an important uh, part in how you live now. So we persevere all the way through to receive that. Now, in Hebrews 11, 13 through 16, He's talking about these great men of God who died. So did they receive the promise? Uh, he says it was not for here. It was something that was to come. And that they lived in this life as, as pilgrims just passing through. They were strangers and exiles passing through this life knowing the great reward was to come. So again, if you look down at verse 16... What are they supposed to look? What were they looking forward to? We're speaking of the Old Testament saints that he has mentioned there. What were they looking forward to? It was not just this uh, this this betterment of their life here and now, which is so popular in today's name it and claim it, gab it, grab it, speak and receive it, false theologies. Right? It's now, now, now. God wants me to be rich, and God wants me to be healthy, and God wants me to be powerful. Right? And it's all about now, now, now. But we don't find that in the Word of God. Instead, you have all these wonderful examples that He is about to give in chapter eleven of people who are dead. And who did not die in super powerful, rich uh, positions of great wealth. It was not here. They were exiles. What does an exile have? Nothing. They, they, they have nothing, right? We receive political exiles to the U.S. sometimes because their, their governments or whatever are chasing them out. And we receive them and they, they literally have nothing. They show up with absolutely nothing. And that's kind of what he's, he's speaking about here. These great Christians, like the who's who, if you had to make a wall of the who's who in faith and put their names up there and you look at where they ended their life, you don't go, wow, look at the castle that guy had. Look how many cars he had. He had seven different homes, right? Oh, this is amazing. I want to be like that guy. No, they had very little and they had great persecution and great suffering and yet where are they now? And this is really important because sometimes we look here too much and we forget to do what the author of Hebrews is telling them. Look, even if everything gets taken away, have joy because you or your name is associated with Christ. And what should you expect from a sinful, dark world, from the sons of obedience who are directed by Satan himself? We, in this life, will have struggles. But the life to come. And this is what they were looking for in that verse 13 and 16, and even in verse 1. That, that not only they, these Old Testament uh, believers, persevered and are there now, but he says also that the people he's writing to right then and there should also have this same assurance. It is not here. Now, how often do we, as people, maybe not you, but uh, uh, many of us, when bad things are happening, think that, oh no, this is bad, right? This is, it, it could be bad. But a lot of times when we have weak theology or we're weak emotionally or biblically kind of, uh, kind of weak and bad things happen, we often say, oh no, you know, uh, uh, God is against me for this or God is doing this to me and this is bad or God's abandoned me or something to that effect. And yet we look at scriptures and realize, no, this is the typical life of a Christian. Like this is very typical. Trials, tribulations, persecutions, great difficulties are going to come. So what do we do? We prepare and we look back for strength. We look to others for strength and we look to our eternal home uh, to gain strength for where we are at. Look at verse, uh, Hebrews 10 verse 34 if you just go back a little bit and you can see he brings the same point to bear with those who had gone through the persecution before that were still alive. And he is connecting this to where the saints of old have persevered as well. Look at 1034. He says, For you had compassion on those in prison, and you joyfully accepted the plunder of your property. Why did they accept it with joy? Look, since you knew that you yourselves had a better possession 
and an abiding one. So what we find is this perspective of your eternal home is great not only for the Old Testament saints, but for the New Covenant saints as well, and for us as well, that even when they were in persecution, even though they had lost everything, they lived with joy knowing they had a better possession, one that could not be taken from them. And we've covered that before in great times of persecution where martyrdom is imminent or the destruction or removal of everything that you have. You think back to Paul going into Damascus, hunting down Christians, dragging men and women out. It's what he was on his way to do. He had done this before and they lose everything. Many were probably, looks like put to death. It's like, what is the worst thing that can happen to a Christian? You might think, oh, taking everything away and putting to death, that would be bad. But yet, you have an abiding possession that cannot be taken away. You will immediately go into the presence of God. And that is where we are going. That is what we're persevering. So no matter what this world throws your way, no matter how many sons of disobedience rise up or how dark the world gets, we continue to persevere. So where we are going should radically shape our lives in the present. So make a note of that. Put that in your head. I've been putting that in my head this week. Where we are going should radically shape our lives in the present. We should live with the inner conviction of knowing that even though we cannot see heaven now, by faith we know that it is our home. We are strangers. We are exiles as we are here. But we know that we are the king's children. We know that we have this great inheritance that is to come. A similar passage, look with me at Romans chapter 8, verses 18 through 25. And Paul writes very similarly of suffering in this life, but yet the hope that is to come. And Paul is one who can speak from much experience as he not only persecuted and caused Christians to suffer, but after he was saved, it was reversed, and he was the one persecuted and suffered greatly. So he had been on both sides of that. Romans chapter 8, verse 18 through 25. And notice how similar this is to, where, to the context of the Hebrews. Paul says, For I consider that the suffering of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for adoption as sons, the pre redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved. Now, hope that is seen is not hope. For who hopes for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it patiently. So here he's writing again. If you go back to verse 18, he's talking about sufferings, right? And he says that no matter what you're suffering here as a believer, no matter how bad it is, verse 18, in the present time, it is nothing. You cannot even compare, truly incomparable to the glories that are to come that will be revealed to us. And so Paul is saying, look, this is bad. Yes, I agree. Sufferings hurt. The lashes on my back hurt. Getting stoned basically to death hurts, right? Paul had been through a lot. But that is nothing compared to the glory that is to be revealed. And he continues down. If you look at verse 25, very similarly to what the author of Hebrews writes there in verse 1, talking about the certainty of things not seen and the assurance of the hope that we have. Look at verse 25. But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. And he's talking about here this, this glorification that we will be in the dwelling place of God. There is indeed a bodily resurrection. If we look at Corinthians 15, we don't know exactly what that is going to be, but we know that when we die, we go to heaven right now. The odds are there will be a body in the ground though, right? Uh, but we also know 
that there is going to be this reunification and God will raise it up just as he rose the body of Jesus back. We will rise with him one day. And that's what he's saying in verse 18 through 25. These, in this life, we suffer. We suffer. There's difficulties in life. Our own bodies suffer as well. But yet, there's going to come a day. And we groan for that day. We eagerly expect that day. Through suffering, through persecution, through difficulty, we look to what is to come, even though we cannot quite see it. For the Christian, whatever suffering comes in this life is incomparable to what lies ahead. And this is what we have to remember. Don't focus on the pain so much that you forget whose you are and where he has taken you. And this is really important. Again, if things are good right now and easy in your life, then apply these things for the day that you do need them. But don't focus on the pain so much when you're in difficulty that you forget whose you are. You are God's and where you're going, where he is taking you, and you are going to be with him. You are going to be in heaven. So don't let your difficulties cloud the view of your ultimate destination. And this is a struggle that we always have when bad things happen. It's, it's like, oh, man, but focus. Focus on whose you are and where you're going and know that God is sovereign. He's still in tra charge of all things. Um, it is also important when we think on these things and examine this passage to keep the word faith in context. Go back to verse, uh, chapter 11 there in verse 1 of the book of Hebrews. Hebrews 11. Verse 1. And again, sometimes uh, this is a popular memory verse, which is, is completely fine to, to do. Uh, but sometimes this verse is kind of ripped out of context. And it takes on a, a, a kind of a, uh, a empty meaning, me, emptier meaning than it should. So uh, as we look at this chapter 11, verse 1, he's talking about faith faith, right? But if you just read it as now faith is assurance of things hoped for and the conviction of things not seen, if you take that out of context, that faith could be kind of whatever. And that's kind of what our world has right now. This, 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 you know people like this who have faith that they are going to heaven, but yet they don't have the faith. They just have this true wishful thinking, okay? Now, do people have faith that will go to heaven yet end up in hell? It's one of the thoughts I had as we went through this. And uh, the answer is absolutely yes, right? Uh, we have tons of people who think they're on their way to heaven, who think they're right with God, but yet the basis, the foundation of their faith is wrong, utterly wrong. So within the context of Hebrews... It's all about the person and work of Jesus Christ. So all of that is assumed as we get to chapter 11, verse 1. That is the faith. That is the substance of the faith. You're not saved because you have faith in heaven. You're saved because you have faith in Jesus Christ. And you can't have heaven without Jesus Christ. But a lot of people in our day try to skip over the Jesus to get straight to heaven. So their, their object of their faith is heaven, not Jesus. But you can't have one without the other. So we want to make sure that point is, is clear as we look at this. True faith is not in a place, but it's the person who can get you to the place. A note I made this week was uh, saving faith is not in a place alone. It's in Christ alone. So this is what we have to make sure we understand as we come across these verses today. And as we hear these verses shared, shared sometimes in our society, it is a verse that sometimes, again, people just kind of rip it out of context and create their own faith. Well, I'm sure I'm on my way to heaven. I have great certainty. Why? Because I'm a pretty good person or whatever that is. That's foolishness. That's 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 horrible. That's wishful thinking, but it's, it's, you're definitely not on your way to heaven. Uh, what's the most common reason people think they're on their way to heaven these days? Most commonly, you can talk to the guys that do more of the street evangelism, Jeff and Anthony and others that are out there a lot, but it's, they, they think they're good enough. They think they deserve it, right? I'm not as bad as some people, and I'm a pretty good person, but when you say something like that, what are you doing? You're trampling under your feet the Son of God. You're saying he was worthless. There was no reason for him to come because I am good enough. You're treating his sacrifice, God's 
perfect lamb sacrificed on our behalf as absolutely nothing. And this is what we're facing today. People think they're on their way to heaven, but yet they have utterly rejected Jesus Christ. So what we want to see here is that true assurance and confidence, like the author of Hebrews is talking about in 11 verse 1, of one's entrance into heaven is a byproduct of true faith in Christ. So people who live in sin, brag about their sin, don't love the God of the Bible, don't want to be around Christians following the ways of this world, and yet they still say, yes, I have faith that I'm on my way to heaven. That is just wrong thinking, absolutely. But for a believer who has rested in the person and work of Jesus Christ, and saying by Christ alone, by grace alone, by faith in Christ alone, I am saved. This is the assurance. This is the certainty we can have. When you look in the mirror and say, not by me, but by grace, and I'm looking to the cross, the one who is the priest, the one who is a sacrifice, who has made me right with God, and the assurance of my salvation is in him. So this we have confidence in. Look with me, hold your place there at Ephesians chapter 1, verse 13 and 14. I just want you to see how this is, Paul ties this together in this one passage. So again, you can't have heaven unless you have Christ. It is Christ that we trust in, Christ that is the object of our faith, not just heaven. But once you have Christ as the object of your faith, you also by faith know that you are on your way to heaven. Verse 13 and 14 of Ephesians chapter 1, Paul says, In him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guaranteed guaranteed of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. Now, again, we, as we look at this, we notice that they, who they had to believe in. It is the gospel. Paul in Romans 1.16 says it is the gospel that is the power of God unto salvation. Here in verses 13 and 14, Ephesians chapter 1, it is the gospel of their salvation that they believed in and then what do they receive? They're sealed with the promised Holy Spirit. They're guaranteed, verse 14, underline it, circle it, whatever you want, that he is the guarantee. The third person of the Trinity is guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it. This is beautiful. So it is in Christ, in him, in his work that they have believed. They have received the Holy Spirit as a seal, a permanent mark that is there forever. And it is a guarantee of the inheritance that is to come. So it is belief or faith in Christ that produces the guaranteed inheritance. So if there is no belief in the gospel, don't expect the inheritance, right? But it is through the gospel that we know, we have hope, we have certainty of the inheritance that is to come. Now flip back to uh, chapter 11. We'll move on down to verse 2. <clears throat> Pretty short verse here. He simply says, for, it, for by it, again that it is referring back to the faith of verse 11 and verse 39 of chapter 10. But he says, for by it the people of old received their commendation. So this, this it is the faith. And the, the, what he's getting at here is that they've received their commendation, not just here on earth, but by it. Faith that perseveres, faith that is sure and steady, faith that is certain. And again, in context of chapter 11, 13 through 16, they receive their commendation. Where are they at now? Well, they're dead, or their bodies are, right? But yet they've received their commendation. They are in heaven right now. How did they get there? Persevering faith. They never stopped. They continued to have faith all along. So as we think on this, this life is temporary and has many difficulties. In contrast to what is to come for the believer who goes on to eternal life with no difficulties. So this is important because this life is not all there is. The best is yet to come. And it's, 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 it, this is something that's 
um, you know, our, our world is very now centered, and it's uh, there, there's a, a, a person out there who has wrote, written the book, Write Your Best Life Now type deal. And I know that none of you have that book or know that author very well, unless you speak against that person. I shall not mention the name. I <laughs> uh, don't want to give him any credit. But anyway, that, that is the focus of so much professing Christianity now. It's this, this right now, 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 now. And yet, as we read the Word of God, it's like it's, it's looking what is to come. And even when this life serves you up things that you don't like to eat, and it's, you wish you had something else, and yet we still look to what is to come. And this is where our focus remains. And we fast forward, we think of those who persevered, the, the saints of old, they received their commendation. Last week we looked at Matthew 25, where Jesus said, as they came before him, those who, who had believed in him for their salvation, he says, well done, my good and faithful servant, enter in. I mean, this is God. Think, think about just, it's hard, you can't even get your mind around it. But the one that created the universe, the, the one that we've sinned against, but yet, yet sent Jesus to die on the cross for our sins, and now we're dead before him, and he says, well done, my good and faithful servant, enter in. And this is the commendation that we look forward to as well. They are entering into heaven. We will enter into heaven. Why? Because Jesus Christ has made the way. So in the end, we of course see that the one who created the universe is also the final judge. And also our final judge is our high priest. And also our final judge is the sacrifice that is paid for our sins. So we have no fear and we live with this confidence throughout this life that we will enter in. We will receive this commendation so we keep on persevering. Look at chapter 11, verse 3 there in Hebrews. He says, By faith we understand that the universe was created by the word of God so that what is seen was not made out of things that are visible. Now this is an interesting twist, I think, and but it's just fascinating. He's going from, and he's going to go to talking about people that are strong in the faith, but yet this is an interesting twist here. He goes from talking about Christ, he's spent much time and effort on the person and work of Christ, and uh, the new covenant that he has made in Christ, and yet, and then going on to faith and perseverance, right? And then out of nowhere, it seems, he brings up this, this certainty of God creating the universe. And it's a really change. Like if there was going to be a chapter division, I'd have moved it probably down here. Because all of a sudden there's a radical change. It's really interesting. Even though it's by faith still, it's really interesting um, that he's going back to the creation. So look at verse 3 again. By faith we understand that the universe was created by the word of God. So what is seen was not made out of things that are visible. So why does he do this? Uh, because we are living in a real place, again, we can tap on things, see things. It's easy to, to understand this is reality. And, but yet, the same faith that we look forward to of God that we cannot see yet, we also, with that same faith, look back to seeing how God created everything out of nothing, visible. So that even though we can't see heaven, yet even right now, you're living in a very real reality and place that God created when it was not. And it's really interesting how he ties these things together, that our faith that we look forward to and what God has prepared for us, we're living right now in a place that at one time, if you could say the word time, was not here. But yet God spoke this into existence. So even though we were not there to see how God did it, we have faith that he did. And our same faith is looking forward to saying we have faith that God will. So it's faith to the future and faith looking back as well. It's really interesting. And, and this, what does this have to do? Think about the context again, who he's writing to. Why on earth would he write to a people who are in persecution and remind them that God created everything. It's really odd. I mean, at first you might think, oh, it is kind of odd. I mean, if you had a friend who is suffering and, and, and being persecuted, tribulation, difficulties, trials, whatever it is in their life, they're going through a difficult time, would you say, just remember, God created everything. 
out of nothing. And you're like, oh, I don't know. Maybe you should. Look, look, look at verse, uh, to hold your place there. Turn over to Job 38. I know you guys have just finished up Job with Jeff Patton's Bible study and our Job experts now. That's wonderful. Great book to go through. And it really ties in well kind of with the theme there of Hebrews and suffering and persecution, and yet God is sovereign over it all. But in Job 38, Job has gone through immense persecution. He's gone through all kinds of pain. And all of this at the sovereign hand of God, right? Satan came before God and God recommended Job, who was the most righteous man on the earth. How would you like to be that person? I don't know after reading Job. I'd like to be second maybe, you know. <laughs> I don't want to be that much on the target. But, uh, but here, he, I mean, he's recommended by God to Satan, take everything he has. And that's exactly what Satan does. And he comes back and he's still the most righteous man on earth. And God says, take his health, but just don't kill the man. And so you have a man who is suffering, 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 great loss, death of his family, the removal of everything he owns is just gone, is taken away, his own body is covered in ulcers and sores, and he's just, it's horrible. He's, he's wrecked with pain. And he wants to know why this happened. So the question again is why, 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 why? And some friends come along and they try to put their best guesses forward. But in the end, he wants to know why this has happened. He acknowledges to some degree, it seems, that God knows the answer and God is in charge. But look at look what, how God begins to comfort him or begins to bring him to his, to his wit's end to rely on who God is. Look in chapter 38, verse 1 through 5. Then the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind and said, Who is this that darkens counsel by words without knowledge? Dress for action like a man. That sounds pretty scary coming from God, right? Dress for action like a man. I will question you and you make it known to me. Where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? Tell me if you have understanding. Who determines its measurements? Surely you know. Or who stretched the line upon it? All right, so I'm not going to keep going, although you could keep going through the, these chapters as it talks about the sovereignty of God over all things, from the feeding of the birds to the rain to the lightning, to, to every detail. But, but God here in chapter 38 puts him in his rightful position by saying, Look, you are a creature. You are a man. And here that he's using this word man here to remind him who he is. You are not God, Job. You don't have the mind of God. You don't know what I know or why I do what I do. It, for instance, where were you? I know you're in lots of pain, but where were you when I spoke the world into existence? That's humbling, right? As, as a creature, you're like, okay, yeah, I've only been around you know, a few years, I don't really know, God. And that's the whole point of this. You have, you have Job who's in great persecution, wanting to know why, 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 yet God comforts him by saying, where were you when I created the world? It's like, whoa. And immediately you begin to see the creatureliness of Job and who God is. Where are you, old man? Dress like a man, right? So it's, it's, it's amazing that, that this comforting, this, is, is comfort, this comfort here to Job... Uh, we see something very similar over there in the book of Hebrews. There are people being persecuted. There are people who are undergoing great trials and tribula tribulations. The author is talking about persevering faith, and yet he reminds them of the eternity that is to come, and then he brings back the creation. So by faith we look forward to what is to come, but by that same faith we realize that God created everything. And the very God that created everything, the very God who created the world that I'm standing on now, also has my future. And so the same faith rests in both of those. All right? Now, uh, uh, let's see. Look, think on this for a minute, because I think it is really important. Um, remembering who God is can be difficult when we are in pain, yet it is remembering who He is that brings the greatest comfort. And I think this is a key the author of Hebrews is getting across, and I think it's a key that, that God is getting across there in Job chapter 38. It's, yes, there is pain, but remembering who God is is truly the greatest comfort. Even as you go through the book of Job, after God asks all these questions to Job, and he doesn't have the answers to them, at the end, 
Job, the most righteous man on the earth, now sees God for who he truly is and for, sees himself for who he truly is. And what did God do? He never answered the question, why? Never did. He just revealed himself more clearly, exalted himself. And Job finally said, okay, now I see. And this is important. We, I, I deal with people, I, one person, individual I know, lost his wife uh, years ago and always still has those questions of why, why, why. And at some point, you, you, you just had to realize, like Job, you're not going to get to the answer sometimes of why these difficulties are there. Why do I hurt so bad? Why did this happen? Instead, you rest in the person of, of Christ. You rest in where you're going. You know that God is sovereign over all things, right? And so finally, Job stopped asking the why once he realized who God was. So what do you do when you're in a hard time? You might go back and commiserate with Job, but make sure you co-celebrate with Job as you get to the end, okay? <laughs> that God is God. I am a man. I've been questioning God, okay? So think on those things. Now, uh, as we look at this verse, go, go back to Hebrews and... Uh, Oh, I'm going to have you look at a couple different places. That's okay. You can get your exercise. Hold your place there in Hebrews 11. We'd also look over at Romans chapter 1, 18 through 20. All right, the Hebrews 11. I'm just going to read that one more time to keep that in context. He says, verse 3, By faith we understand that the universe was created by the word of God, so that what is seen was not seen, not made out of things that are visible. All right. So this is this is... Really fascinating. We're going to touch on this a little bit today. Ah, just a couple of minutes here. I'm trying to try to fast forward. But what can nothing create is a question that I'm posing to you today. What can nothing create? And the question is answered by nothing. Good job, Kyle. <laughs> All right. So given enough time, though, what could nothing create? Nothing. All right. All right. The same answer applies. So, so what can create? What can nothing create? Nothing, because nothing has has no power. There's literally no power. So today, it's most commonly said by supposed scientists that given enough time and chance, the universe came into being. Right? Uh, don't not write that. That's what we believe. But that's what they believe. That enough time and chance uh, that eventually the universe just came in came into being. But how can such thing happen, right? If there is nothing, then how could there ever be something? Uh, nothing can create nothing. And if, if given enough time, how much power could nothing ever muster up? Uh, none. If, if, if you multiply nothing times a million, you still have nothing. So if you have a trillion years that goes by and you multiply that out, you still have nothing, okay? But yet this is our modern view of the creation of all things. And as dumb as that is, as stupid as that is, given enough time and chance, it sounds sophisticated, I even rub my beard on that one, right? Uh, time and chance, they eventually everything just came into being, is completely stupid. I mean, nothing can ever, ever, ever create something. And no matter how much time goes by, nothing still has no power. But yet, so the author of Hebrews is saying, look, we know by faith God spoke and created all things. And look at, look at Romans 1, 18 through 20. You'll look at more of this in your discipleship time today. But it's very important to understand, we've covered this before, but there are no true atheists. They're tr simply truth suppressors because all anyone has to do is think on that for a moment. But yet, deep down, they know that that is true. Look at verse 18. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men, who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. For what can be known about God is plain to them because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since when? The creation of the world and things that have been made so they are without excuse. So here, this is it. I mean, this, this verse is so plain. It ties really in, really well in over here with Hebrews 11, verse 3. But here we have... The, the truth suppressors, they're suppressing the truth in unrighteousness. Verse 20 says, it's clearly known. God's eternality is on display by the things that are created, by the creation itself. 
because nothing always produces nothing. And no matter how much time goes by, you would still have nothing. The fact that there is something means that there has been an eternal something, someone who has the power to create. So this Romans 1.19 is so clear. Look at this. For what can be known about God is plain to them. It's talking about all humanity because God has shown it to them. What does God show? Just the fact that you exist now proves that there is a God. The fact that there's a chair in front of you proves that there is a God. Uh, this, this is what the, the author is saying, uh, of Rome, uh, Paul is saying here, just the fact that you exist, the fact that anything exists, proves that there is something versus nothing, and that something is God, and every person knows this about God. Look at verse 20 of uh, Romans 1. His invisible attributes, this is something that we cannot see, namely, look at this, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world. So this is, this is an amazing point that, that his eternal power it, it is ongoing, no beginning, is on existence. By, all, we can see it simply by looking around. You look up, you look down, you look anywhere around, you stomp your feet. Everything that you do in this reality in this, on this earth shows that something has existed that created all things. It's really, really beautiful, okay? Now, if the God did not create the universe, then there is no meaning to life. There is no value of life, and there are no rules, and there is no justice. And this is the society that seems to be rising up right now. If you deny that God created everything, you're only left with a cosmic accident, which is based on absolutely horrible logic, right? That nothing, uh, nothing ever was, and nothing somehow created everything, and now nothing matters. If there, if there is no God who intelligently created and gave mankind value, then truly your life doesn't matter. And what you find in the generations that are coming up, they're being taught this earlier and earlier, you're a cosmic accident, right? Or you evolved from monkeys over the past millions of years, then how do you get value in life? I mean, truly, what is the difference if it's all a process of evolution of someone murdering someone or stepping on a roly-poly? Uh, what, what do you say to that kind of, I mean, how is there any difference? But yet we know there's a massive difference because we're created in the image of God. And so there's this, everything hinges on this. There must be faith that God created all things for there to be order in this world, for there to be meaning, for there to be purpose, for there to be value, right? We fight for the unborn life. Why do we do that? Because this is a creature that's created in the image of God. This is a person. But now you have, have vast amounts of millions of children being murdered every year and not born, even cases now where they're born left to die because the mother decided ahead of time they didn't want that child to be. But how, how, this is the natural product once you remove God out of the picture. There is no difference in that child according to them and whatever, the bug that they, they stepped on on the way in. It's horrible. I'm saying those, but this is what, this is what we expect. If you, I'm going to leave, leave you to this in discipleship today. We're going to look at the ramifications of taking God out of the mindset of the public. And if you remove God, it is utter chaos. And that's what we're finding more and more. And I do have more today, but I think I'm going to hold up right there. We'll pick up here where we, uh, where we uh, leave off. Let me just hit this real quick, where we left off next week. Uh, let me just hit this. Many professing Christians have an atheistic belief of the creation, yet try to hold to a theistic belief of the end. And this is extremely contradictory, because as we're seeing here in the book of Hebrews, it's the same faith, right? The same faith that's heading there is the same faith that you look back and realize that God created everything. And if you have no faith to believe God created everything, you should have no faith that God's going to have your eternal destination over here preserved as well. So we see it being the same. Uh, misplaced faith with ultimate origins will lead to misplaced hope in ultimate endings. All right, let's stop there for today. Let's pray. Dear Holy Father, we thank you that we have your clear word that gives us wonderful comfort that even in times of trouble, persecution, personal pain, physical pain, emotional pain, spiritual pain, 
whatever it is, whether it's, whether it's on this life having nothing, everything taken away, whether it's the public that rises up, as often is the case throughout the word, where the public rises up against those who have faith. Lord, whatever we face in this life, we don't know, but we know that you do. And that you are sovereign. And they're just quickly reflecting over Job and thinking about who he was and what he went through. And even though he was the most righteous man on earth, but yet he persevered. And we, and we look back at the lessons that he learned and realize that even in persecution, even when things are bad, even we have great difficulty and our bodies hurt and our minds hurt and we're emotionally wrecked, that we are to remind ourselves of what you reminded him of. Where were we at? when you created the world and spoke these things into existence. And you are the very God who is over our lives now and the very God that we trust fully with our lives and with our eternal destination. God, help us more and more to see the creation, to look around and realize that the creation screams that you do exist. And just by that, help us to look forward not the creation, the new heaven, and the new earth that is to come, in which we have sure, steady assurance, a certainty of those things that we cannot see because Jesus has made the way for us. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray.